the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is at its worst point in years. And so world leaders are calling for an idea that's been around for decades. We need to renew our resolve to pursue this two-state solution. We must never lose sight of how essential the two-state solution is. Live side by side. In two states. A two-state solution. A two-state solution. The two-state solution means the creation of an independent Palestinian state that would coexist alongside Israel. It's long been seen as the best hope for peace, but it's never really come close to happening. And the reality on the ground now, after the October 7th Hamas attacks and Israel's military offensive into Gaza, may make it more difficult than ever before. So is the two-state solution actually a viable option or just a talking point? Here's some of what makes it so difficult. One of the first big challenges is what would the borders of a Palestinian state even look like? To understand why that's so hard, we have to go back in history, but this is not a full account. We're going to take you through some of the pivotal moments in this long contested history. After the horrors of the Holocaust, the United Nations voted to establish the State of Israel as a refuge for the Jewish people in their ancestral homeland a decision that angered the majority Arab population. The plan was to divide historic Palestine, the land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, which had been under British control, into two states, one for Jews, one for Arabs, with Jerusalem under international control. Jewish leaders declared the establishment of Israel on May 14, 1948. But five surrounding Arab nations rejected the UN plan and attacked Israel, the start of the 1948 Arab-Israeli War. The creation of Israel and the war upended life for the Arab population in what Palestinians call the Nakba or catastrophe. Some 750,000 people fled or were expelled from their homes becoming refugees across the Middle East and in what's now the West Bank and Gaza. Today, some 5.9 million UN-registered Palestinian refugees claim links to that displacement. At the end of the war in 1949, Israel controlled more land than it had under the UN plan. Jordan took the West Bank, Egypt took Gaza. Jerusalem was divided, with Israeli control in the West and Arab control in the East. These armistice lines became known as the Green Line, still the internationally recognized boundaries between Israel and the Palestinian territories today. The Green Line is also known as the pre-1967 line because things changed in the six-day war between Israel and its Arab neighbors that year. Israel won, going past the Green Line, taking full control of Gaza and the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, the start of the decades-long Israeli military occupation of the Palestinian territories. So for Palestinians, the Green Line is the starting point for any negotiations on the borders of a Palestinian state. Because they want the Israeli military out, ending conditions that some rights groups have condemned as apartheid for denying Palestinians equal rights. Occupation is a daily reality of violence. Every aspect of your life is controlled by a foreign country. When and how Noor Oda is an author and activist in the West Bank, where three million Palestinians live under strict Israeli restrictions and surveillance. Whether I can travel from one city to another for work or to visit family is up to an Israeli soldier at a checkpoint. You could be subject to detention and you have no recourse for justice. But for Israel, the green line is a non-starter. While Israel is prepared to make generous compromises for peace, it cannot go back to the 1967 lines. Israel points out the Green Line was never meant as an official border, but an armistice line. And it says it poses a danger to its security, arguing the Green Line makes the country too narrow in places to defend. Oh, 
Its security fears heightened after Hamas militants stormed into Israel on October 7th. Our armies of terror, if you wish, the Hamas, Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, the Houthis, they are all basically attacking Israel militarily. This is an unbearable situation for Israel. It's an unbearable situation for any state in the world. Israel also doesn't consider the West Bank an occupied territory, but a disputed one. Israeli officials call it by its biblical name, Judea and Samaria, home of the ancient Jewish heartland. So there's a fundamental disagreement on what the borders should look like, and that creates a lot of other challenges to the two-state solution. These are one of them, Jewish settlements supported by Israel all across the occupied West Bank. Closed off communities where more than 500,000 Jewish settlers now live, built on land internationally recognized as Palestinian. The West Bank is seen as the heart of any would-be Palestinian state, but this map shows you just how much of that land the settlements are taking up. It, it's effectively rendered the West Bank as, as a patchwork of non-contiguous territories. So I think lo logistically speaking, there is no realistic way of, of implementing a two-state solution. The settlements are considered illegal under international law, but Israel denies they're a violation, approving and funding settlement development over decades. Settlers say they have a religious right to the land. What is pushing us is thousands of years of history of longing to this land. But for many Palestinians, the settlements have meant forced displacement, a loss of resources, even violence. With some extremist settlers targeting and intimidating Palestinians in sometimes deadly attacks. <laughs> Extremist settler violence carried out with impunity, settlement expansion, all make it harder, not easier, for Israel to achieve lasting peace. Despite international pressure, Israel has approved plans to build thousands of new settlement homes. And then there's the issue of occupied East Jerusalem, a bitterly contested place home to holy sites for Jews, Muslims, and Christians. If people can acknowledge that all sides have legitimate claims, whether they're national or religious, then there might be hope. Instead, Jerusalem has often been the scene of violent confrontations. And many of them have happened here. To Jews, this is Temple Mount, where ancient Jewish temples once stood. Just outside is the Western Wall, a sacred prayer site. The holiest place in Judaism. To Muslims, this same place is called the Noble Sanctuary, home to the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock, where Muslims believe the Prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven. Palestinians see East Jerusalem as the capital of any future Palestinian state. It's considered part of the occupied West Bank under international law. But Israel claims all of Jerusalem as its unified and eternal capital. Jerusalem has been the capital of the Jewish people for the past 3,000 years. There have been settlement disputes in East Jerusalem, too, and battles over land that have displaced Palestinian families. You are stealing my house. And if I don't steal it, someone else is going to steal it. No. With settlers filing lawsuits for land they say belonged to Jews before the 1948 war. Palestinians say it's all part of an effort to push them out of the holy city. Jerusalem's future necessarily requires sharing as opposed to the dominance of one group. That is a recipe for continued violence. So a two-state solution would require some kind of agreement on the status of Jerusalem. And that has been a major hurdle in the failed peace talks of the past. Another day of protest and violence on the West Bank. In 1987, Palestinian anger over decades of occupation triggered the first intifada, or uprising. It started out with protests and boycotts before turning violent. The Israeli military cracked down. More than a thousand Palestinians and 160 Israelis were killed. 
But as the violence was going on, something extraordinary happened. The two sides started secret talks, leading to what seemed like a big breakthrough. The signing of the first Oslo Accord in 1993. Today, the formal end of the long blood feud between Israelis and Palestinians. A moment when hopes for peace and a Palestinian state were high. Yasser Arafat's Palestine Liberation Organization recognized Israel's right to exist in peace. Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin agreed to the creation of the Palestinian Authority to run parts of the West Bank and Gaza. That was unimaginable just less than a year before. As Israel's deputy foreign minister at the time, Yossi Balin helped start those secret negotiations. But on the other hand, I was very worried. The picture which I saw was a picture of a peace treaty signed by two enemies. Well, this was not the case. That's because Oslo didn't actually solve tough issues like Jerusalem or what would happen with Palestinian refugees. All that was supposed to be worked out later, but it never was. And attacks from extremists on both sides made everything harder. The prime minister with a vision for peace, dead. Rabin was assassinated by a far-right Israeli student. And Hamas, founded in the First Intifada, launched a wave of suicide bombings in Israel. In 2000, Arafat and then-Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak tried to salvage things, but they got nowhere. When we've seen these repeated failures time and time and again, you have total, um, not just distrust, but even despair. Frustration over the failed peace process set the stage for this, the even deadlier Second Intifada. Once again, Israelis and Palestinians fought in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Suicide bombings and attacks targeted Israelis. Israel deployed military force against Palestinians. 3,200 Palestinians and 1,000 Israelis were killed. The Second Intifada put the conflict on an even darker path, making many feel peace was impossible. Israel, shaken by the attacks, built a separation wall, added more checkpoints, more restrictions on Palestinian movement. So the failure of the peace process brought hopes crashing down, pushing the two sides even further apart. And that's reflected in their leaders today, leaders who experts say pose another hurdle to a two-state solution. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu came to office for the first time in 1996 as a critic of the Oslo Accords. While at times Netanyahu has expressed support for the two-state solution, he's also repeatedly argued against it, saying it would endanger Israel's security. It will not give us peace, it will bring terror closer. And I'm proud of that I have made the creation of a state of Palestine. Netanyahu's latest government is also considered the most ultranationalist in Israeli history. A fragile coalition propped up by far-right cabinet ministers, Itamar Ben-Gavir and Bezalel Smotrich, both settlers in the occupied West Bank who deny the existence of Palestinians as a people. Both were at this internationally condemned conference in Jerusalem, calling for Jews to settle Gaza after the war, meaning pushing Palestinians out. On the Palestinian side, you have two rival factions. There's Hamas, designated a terrorist group by Canada and other countries, and Fatah, the political party of Yasser Arafat that runs the Palestinian Authority. In 2006, Hamas beat Fatah in elections held in Gaza just months after Israel withdrew from the territory. Then, in 2007, there was a brief civil war. Hamas violently pushing Fatah out of Gaza entirely, taking full control and running Gaza ever since. Israel then tightened restrictions, imposing a total land, sea and air blockade upheld in part by Egypt. Some rights groups say it turned Gaza into an open-air prison. But Israel says it's necessary, with Hamas rejecting Israel's right to exist and vowing more attacks like October 7th. 
I know the world is very upset of what Israel is doing in Gaza, but what do you expect from, from a democratic country? How should a democratic country can protect its own people? As long as Hamas is in power, it's a complete, complete disaster. But to Palestinians who support it, Hamas is a legitimate resistance movement against the occupation, one becoming more popular in the West Bank, where rival Fatah is based. There is a lot of raw pain right now. People will side with whoever is seen to be punching back. Fatah is led by Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas. The Palestinian Authority is backed by the international community, and Abbas says he supports the two-state solution. But to many, the Palestinian Authority is too weak, and Abbas himself has been criticized as autocratic, in charge since 2005. Polls suggest more than 80% of Palestinians want him to resign. With the right leadership, you'd have uh, a, a chance of managing, if not resolving, most if not all of the challenges. You need leaders on both sides who are masters of their political houses, not prisoners of their ideologies. You do not have them. So there are so many very difficult and deeply rooted challenges to the two-state solution. And polling after the October 7th attacks and the war in Gaza suggests Israelis and Palestinians are even more hardened. A decade ago, 61% of Israelis said they supported the two-state solution. Now, a near-complete reversal. 65% say they're against it. In a Palestinian poll, just 17% now say they believe in a two-state solution. Instead, most want a Palestinian state across the entire land. So if a majority of Israelis and Palestinians now say they don't want a two-state solution, it's hard to see how it can actually happen. Still, some find ways to hold on to hope that somehow all this suffering will end. Even at such a tragic crisis, new opportunities are created. I'm a Palestinian. We don't have the luxury of not having hope. It won't take too long before people will get back to their senses. In the end, Palestinians will have a chance to be free. Whether I see it or not, I hope I'm that lucky, but I don't know.